welcome back to the channel. Today, we're back in the desert, back in Las Vegas for a very special video because guess who's here? We got Jesse. Normally, he's all alone in that little coach's corner box, but today he's going to do an entire vlog takeover. So he's gonna break down every single hand today. And do you wanna tell everyone a little bit more about today's game? Yeah, this is a 200-400 game that I play. It's some of the biggest stakes I've ever played. It's probably the group I'm the most excited to ever have played with. It's a bunch of guys that I looked up to when I was coming up in poker and then some of the biggest up and coming names in the game today. So Ooh. just awesome group of people, really fun game and I do quite well. Yeah, spoiler alert, he does very well and I'm excited for you guys to see some high stakes action. Let's get to it. This WPT cash game was invite only and streamed from an undisclosed location. I bought in for 50 grand and I'm ready to battle. We start off hot right away winning a few small pots. In the first hand, I raise it up with Queen Jack suited. After the flop checks around, I pick up a straight draw on the turn. But even though it's four ways, I'm gonna semi bluff here. And it gets through. In the next hand, I open the button with ace four and Landon defends in the big blind. Landon Tice. Landon is the young up and comer with tons of hair and even more confidence. Landon falls asleep to strategy videos and wears PO Solver pajamas. Seriously though, nice kid, super kind. The board does not do much for us and I'm trying to check it down, but I end up rivering a gut shot. Landon chooses this moment to decide to bluff, which ends up being perfect for us. And then after that, I pick up ace-queen and find myself in what I think is a mandatory 4-bet spot against Bruno. Bruno Firth. Bruno has a really badass mohawk and plays like a man with a really badass mohawk. End of description. To my surprise, he folds. This puts me up nearly 10k in the game right away. Side note, I was really excited for this session. Like, maybe too excited. Like, stay up all night, don't get a lot of sleep excited. So my nerves are really high going into this. And those first few pots were actually massive in terms of just calming down and remembering that it's just poker. All of a sudden, I'm feeling a lot more comfortable. I start to slide into a rhythm that I'm more used to at the poker table. The conversation's good. I genuinely really like the people I'm playing with and they're all really interesting human beings. So I'm having a great time at this point. And slowly, I start to feel a little less emotionally tied to the results of the session. Little do I know, that is not going to last. So Landon opens from early position, and Scott calls in the hijack. Scott Seaver. Scott is the poker pro that Mike McDermott wishes he was. Scott once talked a player out of calling an all-in with pocket aces after his opponent had trapped him perfectly with the pocket aces. I've got ace-king offsuit, so I'm obviously 3-betting, and I like to go quite large when we're this deep stacked. Landon just calls. Then Scott does something that I honestly really didn't expect. Marlin. Race all in. Yeah, and in comes all of it. This is a massive re-raise and puts me in a genuinely weird spot. I don't think Scott ever has aces here, and maybe not even kings. Those hands would try to milk me a little more with a smaller bet. I also think Landon doesn't have aces ever with the way he's played it and the timing of his call. So I'm only losing to the occasional kings. On the other hand, I really doubt either of them are going to get in with ace-queen, so I'm not really beating much either. Eventually I just decide, man, there's too much money in the middle for me to not flip with Scott here. And if I can get Landon to fold some pairs that are flipping with me, I might just end up showing up with like ace-king versus ace-king versus Scott. And we chop up a bunch of money in the middle, which is actually a pretty big win for me. So I pile it in, Landon folds nearly immediately, and I find out that I'm flipping with Scott. Not the worst result. Landon actually snap folded jacks and he told me later on that he thought it would be quite close with kings. So I feel like my thought process wasn't too bad here. All right, now Scott and I do some business. We decided to run it four times. It was pretty early on the session and I feel like we both just thought it would be really fun to run out a bunch of boards. We hit the first one on the river and locked that one up. Scott gets the second one very clearly. I come back in the third and just dominate that one. The fourth board is actually super interesting. Last quarter. Wow. Ace, ace, Look queen. Wow. Queen's full of aces for Seaver. I would like to he just you needs to avoid a king out. or a nine on the river here, okay. which he does. So it'll be an even Monster. chop and the players will take their chips back. <sighs> Close one. We nearly got three quarters there. The final result of all this, I'm up $3,000 and 150% in anxiety. A little bit later, I pick up Queen Jack offsuit under the gun, raise it up, and get three callers. The 10 9 deuce flop is decent for my hand, but not for the overall range of hands that I'm gonna have here. And I'm at a position of two players, so I start off with a check. Jake and Scott check behind, and we see an offsuit 10 turn. At this point, I definitely feel like Jake and Scott would have bet their best 10s on the flop themselves, 
And if they had a very strong hand, like a set or two pair, they almost definitely would have bet. So I feel like the ranges are weak, and I'm going to take the initiative here. Scott calls and everyone else folds. The river is about as far from what we're looking for as possible. But that might not be such a bad thing. We've actually got a great hand to bluff with here. We block stuff like queen 10, we unblock hands like pocket sixes and flush draws, and I honestly don't expect him to have the strongest hands when he plays it this way. For all of those reasons, I decided that I'm definitely bluffing here. And if I'm bluffing, I'm going big. Something meaty. 6200. Seaver's got a lot of hand here, so this should boil down to whether or not he is going to give Jesse credit for a 10. Oh. Jesse doing his best not to give anything away. I'm kidding. I'm kidding what it's like. Yeah, it's just. Call check fold, probably. <laughs> Scott finally folds, and I feel like I can breathe again. I found out later that he had ace nine, which I think if he's folding that hand, He's actually folding almost every single hand that he plays this way. So I really like my bluff. I get all of one hand to feel good about this until Landon opens and Bruno three bets. I look down at King Queen and decide to take the more aggressive route. I mean, my man's got a mohawk. I'll wager everything. Instead of giving up, Bruno just jams it right in my stupid face. And with that, I've just lost all of my profit from that nice bluff. <laughs> About 20 minutes later, I have another blind versus blind spot against Jake when I look down at pocket sixes. Jake Daniels. Jake wears fun shirts, and then underneath those fun shirts is the heart of a killer. I end up raising it up here. Jake calls, and we get the absolute dream flop. I mean, my hand is the nuts here. And I'm not talking about like, oh, it's a really strong hand. I'm saying I don't think that Jake ever just calls preflop with tens or queens. I bet small here, which is what I'm going to do with all my bluffs, and I want to stay consistent when I have a good hand. Jake quickly calls, and the turn is the perfect card in offsuit three. So I get a little tricky here and check. I feel like Jake expects me to check a lot when I have an air ball and I'm just giving up. Basically, I feel like a lot of the hands that he calls on the turn are just going to bet if I check anyways. So I'm hoping to get an additional bet in here by check raising. This is risky because if Jake checks back a flush draw, it's kind of a disaster for us. And mentally, I'm just begging Jake to bet here. Jake does not let us down, firing out a nice healthy bet. I fire out a check raise, which probably could have been bigger in retrospect. Jake thinks for a little while and finally lands on call. At this point, I feel like Jake's super likely to have a draw or a one pair hand like a queen. So either way, I'm rooting really hard for the river to be a blank. The dealer absolutely hooks me up with the five of diamonds. I think I might have one of the best possible hands to bet here. I've got a set that blocks flush draws, unblocks top pairs, allowing for him to have the maximum amount of calls. At this point, I don't think Jake's going to have many sets or two pairs, so I think every hand that I bet here wants to go quite large. If you're ever going to take your time, that's, that's the time to do it. 25,800 in the middle. and So Jake starts tanking. I'm doing my best to stay as still and calm as possible, but to be totally honest, Inside my head, I'm just screaming the words call and please over and over again. I know there are pros out there better than myself who use these little quiet moments to meditate or to think up the cure to cancer or whatever the hell those sicko Germans are doing these days, but that's never going to be me. I'm just a simple man praying for a call. So call Jake. Please call. My dogs eat very expensive food. But after what feels like a small lifetime, but it's probably like 25 seconds, Jake lets it go. I find out later on that Jake was thinking of doing something super heroic with five deuce of clubs. It's too bad he didn't. That would have been a 60k pot. Tom finally arrives, a fashionable three and a half hours late. Tom Dwan. Tom was online poker's end boss in 2010. Then he spent 10 years training for the triad, only to re-emerge as live poker's end boss? Weird sequence of events that I may or may not get into based on the triad's interest in this vlog. And while he's getting settled in, we pick up King 7 suited under the gun. I get two callers before seeing the fantastic Queen Jack 10 two club flop. This flop isn't just good for my hand in particular, but it's a great one for my range in this scenario. Landon and Bruno are both nearly always going to be re-raising pre-flop if they have ace king or the big pairs, so I'm the only one who can have the nuts here. So given that massive range advantage, I decide to... check? 
Seriously, I think this check was a big mistake. I'm not sure what was going on in my brain. I think I had just been checking a lot in multi-way pots, especially when I'm out of position, but I think this is a pretty unforgivable check. The fact of the matter is I have a great hand to bet, and I have a hand that can't really win at showdown, and I have a hand that's not going to get raised very often on the flop. I want to chalk this one up to sleep deprivation. I think I'm starting to feel the effects of just having not slept very much the night before because I was so excited to play the game. Anyways, Landon checks back and we see the 10 of spades turn. Now Bruno decides to lead out. At this point, with the way that I've played the hand, I think calling the turn is my best option. Landon gets out of the way and we see a super interesting river card. I think that Bruno's bet on the turn is representing hands like King-9, 8-9, some tens, not very many queens. Maybe a hand as strong as king queen could bet the turn or ace queen, but I just don't think he's gonna have those very often. Meanwhile, when I check back the flop and just call the turn, I've got a lot of queens. So despite massively butchering the flop, I may have found the exact run out where it works out for me. So when he does check, I take the opportunity to bluff. Man, I love when a good plan comes together at the very last second. Did you have a, I wonder if you days. Yeah. Quite a while. <laughs> Like I had Mohawks don't fold, months. come on. This hand was a disaster, dude. Seriously though, I did like my river play. But more importantly, this hand is a really good example of when you make a mistake, just shake it off, try your best to move on, and play your best after it. You're allowed to play a hand bad. You're not allowed to play the rest of the session poorly because you're still thinking about that hand. I lay low for about 25 minutes until I pick up ace-10 offsuit and play a four-way pot where I make two pair on the turn. I end up getting a call from Seaver, who then reluctantly folds his weak top pair on the river. This hand in and of itself isn't super important or interesting, but it sets us up to have a bigger stack for what's about to happen. So the very next hand, Jake raises under the gun, Tom calls in the small blind, I'm in the big blind and look down at the beautiful pocket kings. Now for the sake of time, I've left out a lot of trivial hands, but it's safe to say I've done more than my share of 3-betting and 4-betting throughout this session. So when Jake starts tanking, I really get the feeling that something big is about to happen. Sometimes, you can feel the 4-bet coming. People just have a different energy when they load up a huge re-raise. Jake thinks for a little bit, but he eventually does re-raise. And he makes it 25,000, which is basically an all-in anyways. So I of course pile it in. Now with the easy part out of the way, here comes the hard part. Fading the ace. The first board runs out super pure. The river is a 4. Which, by the way, if you've ever peeled a hand at the poker table before, you know the four can look quite like an ace. So a little heart attack there. I'm not sure if I'm being clear enough about how massive this pot is, but if I win this next run out, this will be the biggest pot I've ever won in my entire life in cash. <sighs> Let's do this. The flop is fantastic. The turn is one of the best cards I could hope for because he doesn't pick up any straight draws or anything funny. And then the river is the beautiful, the wonderful, the always lovely King of Diamonds. Destiny, here we come. If this vlog does nothing else besides getting people to go watch the micros, I will die a happy man. For a second there, I thought he hit the river because you never expect to hit the last king in the deck, and it just kind of looks like a card that's for him. But it definitely was not his card, and we scoop a monster pot, and now we're up 70,000 on the session. Okay, it's official. We are running hot this session, and honestly, it feels awesome. Not 10 minutes later, Scott raises and I look down at pocket queens. At this point, I'm just wondering how far this heater is gonna go. I re-raise, everyone else folds. Scott is certainly not known for giving up without a fight. And that's exactly what he tells me as he makes the call. And we see the eight, four deuce rainbow flop, which is relatively good for my hand. Scott can have the sets here and I probably don't re-raise pre-flop with any of the hands that make sets. So this is a really dangerous flop when we're this deep. Regardless though, I'm definitely going to be betting here, and I'm going to choose a larger size to make it harder on a lot of the hands that Scott will have. The turn is where I think the real decision making happens for me. Now Scott can have a lot of sets by the turn, especially when he check calls the flop, and he can also have hands like ace three. The problem with betting is that he knows that he has a lot of really strong hands on this board, and so I may just get check raise bluffed by some of the other hands he has. Also, I'm not particularly convinced that he's always gonna call the turn with nines or tens, and I really don't think he's calling with ace high. So it's not like I have infinite hands that I'm getting value from. But with a hand like queens or jacks, I'm just gonna check back and play pot control. I think this has to be at least a decent way to play this spot when my opponent is as tricky and smart as Scott is. The river is a nine, which isn't terrible, but I do now lose to pocket nines and eight nine suited. 
My plan here is to basically snap off any bet size that Scott chooses. And if I'm being honest with myself, this is one of the best hands I ever get to the river with. Scott ends up picking a really big size on the river. Looking back at this, I'm a little skeptical whether or not he has enough bluffs here. But if anyone can, it's probably Scott. I end up calling because again, I'm just not folding a hand that's this strong unless he does something crazy like goes all in. Scott ends up showing me the last hand I ever expected to see, the other two queens. So after all of that, we have this really anticlimactic moment where we just chop the pot up. Good times. An hour or so later, the adrenaline is finally leaving my body when I find a nice squeeze spot against Tom and Dan. Dan Smith. Imagine a chess solver came to life only to realize it preferred gambling and electronic music. That would be Dan. Dan quickly folds his hand, but Tom ends up calling. Something I didn't really expect, but it's certainly going to happen sometimes. The 933 flop isn't as bad as it looks at first glance. Sure, it doesn't improve my hand, but it's also really unlikely to have improved Tom's hand as well, which is more important when I'm the preflop aggressor. I bet right around half pot. I'm kind of expecting Tom to either fold or call here almost always, but he ends up having different plans and raises to 20k. Okay, so now we have a decision to make. It's not that we just have to contend with this raise, but it's also that he might bet future streets as well. On the other hand, I have a pretty good hand to call with. I've got two overs, I've got a backdoor flush draw, I might have the best hand right now. I do expect Tom to attack this board pretty light when we're this deep stacked. And he knows I'm up on the session, so he might think that I'm just kind of trying to lock up the win. I just don't think he's going to show up with trips or a full house that often, and he might just call with them when he does. Eventually I decide that my hand is just a little too good to be folding to a player who's capable of bluffing. And if there's anyone capable of bluffing, it's probably Tom Dwan. I mean, this is the guy that I watched on TV for years, bluffing Ivy and Patrick Antonius and all the other legends. So I call, and the turn is the king of clubs. I think this is a very good card for me in general, because I'm the one with all the ace kings. I think that Tom recognizes this too, because he checks back fairly quickly. The river is the very blank five of hearts. At this point, I have to make a decision between turning my hand into a bluff, or just trying to check and see showdown. I can definitely still lose to hands like pocket sixes or eight nine suited, but I just think my hand is too good to be bluffing. Thankfully, Tom doesn't put us to the test, just checking back and mucking when he sees my hand. I find out later on that he had jack 10 of spades, so I actually dodged a ton of outs. That said, I think I really like the way that I played this hand and I wouldn't change anything if I had to do it again. This was a tricky hand that I might have normally backed down in at these stakes and then regretted it later on. So I'm really happy that I didn't do that and I took the line that I just thought was totally optimal in the moment. And I was rewarded. This was actually a pretty large pot to win with ace high and after the pot, I'm up 100k on the session. After that, I run hot in a bunch of small pots. I see bet, take it down. I three bet, take it down. I three bet and then see bet, I take it down. Basically my opponents just didn't make hands for a little while and I won a bunch of small pots. Then in one of our last hands of the night, Bruno raises up from the hijack and I look down at ace nine of diamonds in the button. I decided to just flat this one. The flop is ace king king with two clubs and Bruno bets really small. I don't really see any reason to do anything here except call. The turn is the jack of spades, and now he fires again except a lot bigger than he did on the flop. This is a bit tricky because all of the bluffs that he might have on the flop, stuff like queen, jack, jack 10, those all made pairs and would probably slow down. So now I'm hoping that he has something like 5-6 suited that just kept bluffing, or maybe something like pocket 10s that's blocking the straight, maybe 9-10 suited. Either way, I'm not folding a hand that's this strong yet. I'm gonna call and make a tough decision on the river. The river four is pretty much exactly what I'm looking for. He takes a little bit of time and checks. At this point, I don't really see any value in betting. It doesn't make sense for him to bet twice with a worse ace or a hand with a jack in it. So I don't really see what he's gonna call the river with that I beat. I check it back and he tables pocket tens. So I guess it's possible he could have called on the river, but I think it's really unlikely. Either way, this ends up being the last significant pot that I play for the night and I end the session up nearly $110,000. And that's the end of the vlog today, you guys. I really hope that you enjoyed Jesse's most profitable session ever in one of the craziest lineups. Nice job. Nice job on the poker, but also nice job on the video making. I think he's never gonna give himself enough credit, but I watched him make every single cut on this and all of the notes and all the redos of the voiceovers, and I think it came out really well. Thank you.
<laughs> I hope that we have you back in some future vlogs. And if you guys enjoyed it, let him know below and let me know what you guys think about kind of having like a mixed bag of me and Jesse on the YouTube channel. Thank you guys if you made it all the way to the end of this video. You might be interested in the fact that we're gonna be in San Antonio next weekend, November 17th through the 22nd. We're gonna be hitting up Rounders Card Club where Bet on Drew is hosting some multi-table tournaments, some cash games, some live stream games. Jesse's gonna throw in some PL He's gonna try to get some games off the ground. So if you're in the area or if you're last minute bookers like we are and you can just spontaneously make the trip, we'd love to see you guys there. See you in the next vlog.